Hello, welcome to the channel. Here I'll be discussing some of the issues that arise from spending a lifetime in an evangelical Christian cult and the long-term effects that has on a person, short-term effects, how I got out of it, myriad of issues, and hopefully if you have been in a similar situation or if you're currently in the situation that I was in for over 30 years, you'll get some help from this. You'll get a chance to get some answers. Uh, hopefully it will encourage you to think and to critically evaluate where you're at and where you're going. It is my intent to try and help people escape the damaging long-term effects of extreme Christian beliefs and some of the repercussions and how it affects your life. It's uh, something that we're going to delve into in future series maybe. For today I just want to talk about where I came from and how I got out. Briefly encapsulate that. So I was born and raised into a Pentecostal church here in McMinnville, Oregon. It was always taught as being the one true church. The, everyone else is going to hell. Everyone else is lost except for us. And spent 12 years in their private Christian school. It was extremely uh, rigid in the way, they're, the way they think, the way they operate. There is no outside influence allowed whatsoever. Very much an isolationist community, which is a huge red flag for, you know, being considered a cult is when, say, for example, you have two Catholic churches and they don't talk to each other. Well, they're both Catholics. Why shouldn't they communicate with each other and have fellowship? And <laughs> if you have two Presbyterian churches and they don't have any communication with each other that should set off a red flag that there's an isolationist movement that's there for a reason and so this was the case with my church is that there were many churches around the area we had nothing to do with them there were entire churches that I had no idea they even existed until after I had left that group and had gone and done my own research and found out, hey, these people exist, and that tells you two things. One, they're not interested in sharing ideas with another group, even if that group is very, very similar to their own. And more to the point, they don't want people in their, or this local group, to get infected with uh, how things are operated in other churches. It's They call it ministerial ethics. Really, it's more about protecting their ideas, protecting their own concepts. And a huge red flag is when they cut off outside communication completely. They say no internet, no social media. They severely restrict use of the internet and Facebook and they don't want the church members in constant contact with family members, with friends, except for the express purpose of trying to proselytize them into that organization. And so this is just setting off alarm bells to normal people saying, hey, this is not the way you run a typical church. This is not how you run any social group. This is extraordinary. So, <clears throat> cutting off communication in general, specifically cutting off communication with other groups that believe the exact same thing you do, and another huge red flag is they decide who you can and can't socialize with within that same congregation. So, for example, uh, someone is maybe not following all the rules quite right. 
they can be disfellowshipped. You, you don't let people talk to them and be around them for a certain amount of time. Or a guy wants to date a particular girl, he has to ask permission from church leadership to ask that girl out on a date. Certainly to get engaged or to get married. And so there's all this this concept that the pastor, the leadership, they know God's will for your life. And therefore, if you step outside of that set of bounds and rules, that somehow you're stepping outside of the divine will of God, which is just absolute nonsense. <laughs> There's been a number of marriages that failed that had the approval of those men of God. And it just never seemed like that seemed to make one bit of difference. It was just, but besides the fact that you have no freedom to socialize really who you want to socialize with. So in a very inclusive uh, environment across the board, whether that's internal, external, uh, from a theological perspective or just a social perspective, you are in a bubble. You're locked into this box. And I did not realize how damaging that is to a person's um, personality and their mind until after I got out of that. And it was such a huge world-changing experience to just spend time in public and think everyone here, these are all, all people I can get to know and be friends with, and everything is, is just wide open. It's It's... It blows your mind the first time you experience that. And to some, that's like, you know, you might say that's absurd or ridiculous, but when you've spent 30 years in this environment, in the bubble of the cult, it's, it's something to get out of it. So, one more red flag is when a group is enforcing tithes, offerings, various forms of giving, they require you to pay a fixed percentage of your income in a given um, paycheck or however you get your money. So let's say 10% before taxes absolutely has to be handed in weekly basis, bi-weekly basis. So there's many people that simply can't afford that, especially in the impoverished middle class that's been happening of late, people simply would be losing their apartments or their houses because they couldn't pay rent, they couldn't pay their mortgages. A married couple with a one or two year old kid and they have to move back in with mom and dad. It's like in that situation, a real church should say, okay, you don't have to hand over 10% of your income pre-tax until you can get back on your feet and support yourself and keep a roof over your family's heads. And yet there's no excuse for it. Like they, they push and they push hand over the money, hand over the money. And when it gets to the point where a person leaves that group and the leadership that has been there for decades, has watched every second of that person's life just immediately cuts them off. If you knew somebody for, for 30, 35 years and you knew you saw them three, four times a week for the entirety of that 30, 40 years, and then you can instantly stop communicating with that person. You instantaneously don't text them, email them, call them, visit them that immediately tells you this is a person that does not care about you personally. They don't care about saving your soul for whatever that means. They're expressly interested only in influencing your life and taking your money and whatever power that gives them, but they certainly don't love you. And that's what I saw out of 150, 160 people maybe three or four still talk to me. Text, email, or occasionally meet for lunch. But to be that cold-hearted, to cut people off 
so completely and thoroughly shows it's a it's a very twisted it's a corrupt and it's in some ways an immoral organization there's no other way to put it decent basic human empathy should show you hey just love people accept people for who they are you know i don't exclude people if they want to stay in that group i don't exclude people if people do dumb things you still care about them as an individual for who they are and this is something that should be blatantly obvious to and yet that can go on and multiple people leave you just cut them off disfellowship them cut them out of the social circle um, it's sad and it's as I said it's it's controlling it's very much a cold how I escaped how I discovered I needed to get out what it came down to was being intellectually honest with myself being willing to be curious and not questioning where the evidence led just being willing to look at it objectively and not stop that meant verifying what I was told my entire life so many people just believe it they believe what they're told they never think to second guess it never think to verify anything they just take it at face value and so as a evangelical Christian as a fundamentalist evangelical Christian we were taught from Genesis to Revelation the entire Bible is inspired by a perfect deity it is 100% flawlessly it does not contradict itself etc etc so my discovery was hey, I'm going to find evidence for Noah's flood. Well, guess what? There is no geological footprint of a global flood anywhere in this, on this planet. It just It does not exist. We have multiple examples throughout the fossil record of a layered process whereby ages have occurred over so many years and the amount of time that has passed is staggering. The amount of time that it occurred to develop these layers and layers of rock and fossils and rock and fossils, oil deposits, natural gas deposits, these did not occur in an extremely short amount of time. And there's a wealth of information out there that verifies all this. I spent weeks and months and months learning and whenever I found something I couldn't understand stop figure that out define the topics understand the definitions of these words and I self-taught myself as much as I could to understand what I was reading and there's no question there's never been a global flood there, there is there's no evidence whatsoever to support that and the only people that believe in it, they're literally sticking their fingers in their ears. They're not willing to listen to the evidence. They're not willing to accept what's right in front of their faces. They are essentially willfully ignorant. Same with the rest of the myths of the Old Testament. And that is the Garden of Eden, the Tower of Babel. All these grand stories are just that. They're folklore and myth. That have been adopted and in some cases uh, plagiarized by the Hebrew people for the sake of their own story their own background and so much work has been done with human genetics in the last couple of decades the human genome project with uh, Francis Collins was a huge breakthrough you know the idea that you can prove that a child is the product of these two people. Um, you can verify paternity through the genetics. 
you know, people accept that idea, like, oh yeah, of course, that's, it's no different than any other type of evidence. They're willing to accept the scientific method of determining that a child is <laughs> the result of these two people, and yet they're not willing to listen to the genetic evidence that says we are the cousins to the bonobos and the chimpanzees. They cannot fathom that, and yet the evidence is literally no less solid than saying they're a cousin to a family member of theirs. It's the same procedure, it's the same methods, and yet people will defend what they believe to the death even when it's objectively wrong. And I refuse to do that. I was willing to say, yeah, I was wrong for 30 years. I was misled for 30 years. I was lied to for 30 years. It's a difficult concept. It's, it's, this is not the easy route by any means to lose your entire social circle overnight, to lose so much of what you've spent your life doing, to say these thousands of dollars I've invested in this organization are just flushed down the drain. There's no benefit from it. Yeah, it's it's difficult. Um, unfortunately, that is the cost of truth, is that you can't compromise. You have to say, this is what the evidence shows. This is what we will stick with. The idea that it's difficult cannot sway you. Just because it's difficult doesn't mean that it's wrong. I mean, I mean, it's you have to follow the evidence no matter where it leads. You have to follow the truth no matter where it leads. And this is where it led. The entire Christian faith is based on myth and folklore. We have no evidence that Jesus Christ was the Son of God. We don't. Maybe he existed as a person. But the idea that he changed water to wine, that he walked on the water, that he rose again, none of this can be substantiated. The idea that all the events of his life were written 50, 60 years after his death at the earliest, some of the grandest miracles, stories about him being the Son of God, these details were all added 80, 90 years after his death. The most recent, the most early accounts of his life give no indication that he was deity in flesh. And yet these are all embellished over time like a game of telephone. They just keep adding to the legend. And I think that's a logical explanation for how things came about. But... It's still a flawed, the New Testament is still flawed simply because it makes so many references back to the Old Testament. And these stories in the Old Testament have been proven to be either legend, folklore, outright false. And so we cannot take them as gospel. And so that's where I ended up was I'll keep digging, keep tearing into the data until I can verify anything and everything, and I won't stop until I get the truth. And what I was left with was, I can't prove any of it. I, I can't objectively prove that the Bible is correct, that any of this was written by a supposedly perfectly moral deity. It just it doesn't make any sense, it doesn't add up. And that's pretty much what myself and many other atheists want to get from Christians is just one one piece of evidence. Show us one thing that can be verified. And so far they've been found wanting. It's a lot of philosophy, it's a lot of apologists digging for various methods of proving their God exists. But so much of it is just that, it's apologists no no scientists come forward saying, hey, we've got proof. No, no, nobody has it. 
So that's my story. That's how I got out. In the future, we'll go over specifics of some of these different areas that we've gone over um, briefly. And I hope, I hope this can reach somebody because I remember what it was like to be trying to find answers, trying to find what was the right thing to do. And it was difficult. It was through people on YouTube documenting their experiences and reaching out that got me where I am. And so at the very least, I want to try and reach people and say, hey, you're not alone. Yes, there's there's resources out there. Use those resources. Do not be content to live in the dark. We are in 2018. We have the internet. There's no excuse for ignorance. There's no excuse for not having access to information anymore. So do not compromise. Seek the truth at all costs. Put evidence first. Without evidence, don't accept anything, don't believe anything. It's pretty much what it has to be. Um, but uh, hope you all have get some enjoyment from this and um, peace out.